NetWealth Investments Limited is licensed to provide general advice. Our podcasts are not tailored to any one financial situation and may contain views of our presenters which may not align with NetWealth. The guests, organization, and NetWealth have an arrangement for their financial products to be available for investment through NetWealth platforms, and NetWealth may receive fees from the guest. More information about NetWealth can be found on our website, including our financial services guide and disclosure documents. Please see professional advice before acting. Welcome to the NetWealth Portfolio Construction Podcast, brought to you by the NetWealth Investment Research Team. Join us as we speak with key wealth management professionals to uncover opportunities and challenges on a diverse range of topics. Obviously, if I look at the world today, we can definitely invest at much more attractive prices than about a year ago. With your host, Paul O'Connor. Good morning, all, and welcome to the Net Wealth Portfolio Construction Podcast Series. My name is Paul O'Connor, and I'm the Head of Strategy and Development of Investment Options for Net Wealth. This morning's George Bichet from the Pendle Group joins us for today's podcast. George is a Portfolio Manager of Credit, Fixed Interest, and Enhanced Cash Portfolios, and has significant experience in portfolio management and credit analysis with a specific focus on asset-backed securities, industrials, real estate, and the resource sectors, and has also held dealing roles. He's been with Pendle for 29 years and has also worked in an accounting role for three years. George obtained a master's degree in business, finance, a bachelor's degree in business, and a graduate diploma in applied finance and investment. He also has a registered representatives and dealer accreditation with the Australian Financial Markets Association. George has managed dedicated sustainable fixed interest portfolios for a decade, including the Sustainable Australian Fixed Interest Fund. So for today's podcast, we'll focus on green bonds and the growing opportunity to invest in ESG fixed interest strategies. Good morning, George, and welcome to the Net Wealth Portfolio Construction Podcast. Uh, Good morning, and thank you very much for having me today. Pendle Group is an ASX listed investment manager, actively managing strategies across Australian equities and listed property, Australian and international fixed interest, global equities, multi-asset portfolios, and alternative investments. As at 30 June 2022, Pendle had total assets under management of $111 billion. The business also includes J.O. Hambro Capital Management, a London-based manager of global and regional equities portfolios and multi-asset strategies, and Regnan, a provider of ESG research, engagement and advisory. In 2023, Pendle became part of Perpetual Limited that resulted in a merger of two of Australia's oldest and largest active asset management businesses. There are 14 Pendle and Regnant managed funds on the NetWealth Super and IDPS menus, covering Australian equities, international equities and Australian fixed interest, including the Sustainable Australian Fixed Interest Fund and the Regnant Credit Impact Trust that George is the portfolio manager of. The growth of environmental, social and governance or ESG investment strategies over the last decade has been significant. And in particular, the wealth management industry has increasingly allocated to these strategies over the last five years. ESG strategies originally focused on Australian and international equities, but in recent years we've seen more fixed interest ESG strategies being issued by managers that invest in green bonds. A green bond is essentially a fixed interest security that invests in climate and environmental projects. My understanding is that climate bonds specifically finance projects that reduce carbon emissions or alleviate the effects of climate change, whilst green bonds represent a broader category of securities related to projects with a positive environmental impact. But we will let the expert George explain what his definition of green bonds are. Recent market volatility has been driven by inflation and rises in interest rates, and this has resulted in flat or negative returns for many fixed interest securities. So I'll be interested in George's views as to how green bonds have performed against the wider fixed interest investment universe over the last 12 months or so. 
Traditional fixed interest portfolios invest in as many bonds issued by different entities in an attempt to reduce credit risk in a portfolio. So I will be interested to understand how big the green bond universe is compared to the broader fixed interest universe and if there are any additional risks to investors using these strategies in their diversified portfolios. I note in 2012, green bond issuance amounted only to about US $2.6 billion. But by 2017, green bond issuance soared to a record high of US $161 billion, according to ratings agency Moody's. And this growth continued with issuance reaching $266 billion US in 2019 and then nearly $270 billion in 2020. So there appears to be a significant growth growing opportunity set for investors. So perhaps for starters, George, can you explain to the listeners how you developed a focus on green bond strategies and what attracted you to this area of investing? Yeah, it was interesting, but I started managing, I guess, ESG fixed income funds in 2009. So it's been a while now just managing those dedicated strategies relative to vanilla strategies, which I managed prior to that. But where the interest came about was there was very much a focus on negative screens back in the day, and there was less a focus on how to actually find solutions. And then basically there was these green bonds that started issuing, um, you know, it started in 2011 and then 2014. But when they started issuing, we're actually looking at these bonds and we actually thought these are perfect for these types of ESG funds that I'm running. And the great thing about these specific green bonds uh, that we invest in, at the end of every year from issuance, they actually give you something called an impact report, which talks about the positive benefit you're having via your investments, whether that's renewable energy generated or emissions avoided. You're getting actually data around how you're helping. So really my interest started back then. And over time, as you've mentioned, the growth of that market's actually been quite significant and demand's been very strong. So that's really where the interest started. So from an ESG dedicated type strategy, getting involved in specific securities that actually help with the solutions as opposed to just limit the downside is realistically where where, um, the interest started in these types of securities. Just going back to my definition of green bonds, can you explain how I defined it accurate or um, what else can you add to giving us all a better understanding of of what they are? It was very close. Ultimately, the term green bonds and climate bonds are interchangeable. So they're the same type of securities. They're basically securities that are issued to raise finance for climate-related solutions Importantly, the money borrowed is ring-fenced and can only be used for predetermined projects. Examples of those projects would be wind farms, solar parks, hydroelectricity projects, or low-carbon buildings, low-carbon transport. Similarly, a social bond raises finance for initiatives that improve the social outcomes in the community. And then finally, sustainability bonds are a combination of green and social. So how big is the green bond market in Australia and who issues these securities and is there any concentration of issuance in a certain industry or sector or is sector issuance also broadening with uh, just the more general broader increasing issuance of green bonds globally? The size of the market in Australia is $54 billion, which sounds like a large number, but it's only about 4% of the Australian bond index in Australia. So it's actually quite small relative to the market, but it's a large outright number. So this includes green bonds. They make up about 30 billion of that uh, 54 billion. 10 billion is social bonds and sustainability bonds are 15 billion. Now in relation to the diversification question, we're absolutely over the last bunch of years seeing an increase in diversification of issuance across sectors and across issuers. So if we look at our market today, there's about 10 different sectors uh, within the fixed income market that issue green bonds. There's 40 different issuers and there's about 80 individual securities. So if we think about the sectors, we've got the likes of domestic banks. So for example, Commonwealth Bank, we've got offshore banks, we've got universities, industrials, the likes of West Farmers and Woolworths, real estate, such as GPT, Lendlease, telcos, utilities, sovereign agencies, semi-governments, and Commonwealth government back. There is a lot of diversification, and that's only been increasing over the last 
few years, which actually provides a good foundation for a diversified portfolio in these specific asset class or securities. And I'd suggest that over time, there's going to be more and more issuers coming to the market with these, these securities. Yeah, well, I guess it surprises me a little there, George, when you said it, it really covers the whole gamut of the fixed interest universe, the investment grade yes. fixed interest universe with gubbies and semis and then credit. So it obviously gives you a fair opportunity to diversify a portfolio when you're building the portfolios and the funds yes, you manage. it does. Just specifically on the gubbies, it's not the Commonwealth government issuing these bonds. It's actually a Commonwealth government agency and it's got the Commonwealth government guaranteed issuing it's called National Housing Finance Investment Corp. So they're actually social housing is this specific issuer. So we've been engaging a lot with the sovereign in the hope that they will issue a green bond at some point under the previous government that was highly unlikely under the new uh, government. It's likely, but I'm not sure whether that happens uh, this year or next year, but we're hoping to see one in the not too distant future. So why would you invest in these types of bonds? There's two main reasons. Firstly, if you want your investment to do good and support climate stability or support the underprivileged in society, these are absolutely the securities to invest in. They help transform old carbon intensive infrastructure to environmentally friendly practices. So ultimately, if you want to invest to do good, these are the securities. And the second thing why you'd invest in them is actually a tailwind in relation to performance of these securities as well, because demand is so much stronger than supply. When these new bonds are issued, they perform very well in the secondary market. What's the credit risk of green bonds? And for example, what happens if a solar farm defaults? Are there any rights to the solar farm assets to protect the bondholder? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. The Credit risk for these securities is linked to the issuing entity, not the underlying projects. So the way they work is the money is raised. I'll give you an example. Commonwealth Bank, when they come and do a green bond, the money is raised, the money is ring-fenced and can only be used for predetermined projects. Let's call them wind farms, solar parks. If there's a default on a specific wind farm or a solar park, it actually doesn't impact our security because our credit risk is facing CBA's entire balance sheet, CBA's credit quality, not the individual loans. So what happens is if there is an underlying default of say one of the, the projects, that project tends to be taken out and a new wind farm come back in. So it doesn't really impact the credit quality of our securities because we are facing CBA's balance sheet. This is a really important point. Because we're facing CBA's balance sheet, the security has a high credit quality. However, if we were facing the individual projects, the credit quality will be very low and therefore liquidity in those securities would be very tight, very difficult, and maybe no liquidity at all. But by facing CBA's balance sheet and the credit quality on these securities being quite high, it allows for secondary market activity and allows us to have these portfolios that can buy and sell these bonds in the secondary market to deal with basically the, the flows that we get, whether it's an application of redemption in our fund. So ultimately, the credit risk is for the, to the issuer, not to the underlying projects. That's a very interesting point you make there, George, that whilst the capital raised is ring-fenced on what it can be spent on, the actual credit risk to the investor there is simply the entity that's issuing it, which I guess is Correct. no different to any other security in fixed interest, ignoring asset-backed securities, of course. It makes sense there, and the credit risk then is a lot lower, I guess, than what a lot of people would have thought. Yes. Can companies historically regarded as, say, a large polluter or producer of old energy actually issue green bonds? And how would you analyse and get comfort that a bond is genuinely a green bond? Is it all about the strength around the ring fencing of how the capital will be deployed? Yeah, again, that's a fantastic question. Pretty much any company or entity can issue a green bond, assuming they have the underlying green assets to do that. So whether you're a, a big polluter or a small polluter, that doesn't really matter. Anyone can issue it. Now, however, that doesn't mean we invest in it. When we go through our process, we ensure that there is an alignment between the ESG credentials of the issuer and their climate vision as well as the underlying projects. So if you have a large polluter that is committed to reducing emissions 
in a quick way, stretch targets. Instead of not just business as usual, they're actually committing to reduce emissions as quickly as possible. We would absolutely look at the green bonds from that specific issuer. However, if you've got a large polluter who doesn't really care about the climate, doesn't really have any commitments to reduce emissions in a stretched way, we would not look at that that green bond from that issuer. So ultimately, it's really important for us that there is an alignment between the issuers, ESG credentials and climate vision, as well as the project. So ultimately, we don't invest in every bond, every green bond that comes to the market. We may invest in one in every third bond that comes to the market, whether it's related to credit quality, not happy with ESG credentials of the issuer or the valuation of the security. So it's really important to not only look at the underlying projects, but to look at the, the vision of the entity itself that's issuing. How clear is it that the underlying projects are actually green or ESG? Is, is, can that be a, a, quite a complex area of analysis for, for you and your analysts? Yeah, for sure. We do a huge deep dive into obviously not, not only the issuer, but a deep dive into the projects as well and looking at are these the type of projects that we want to be involved in? Uh, what are the risks around these projects? How much are they actually going to contribute? We have a huge impact database that collects information pretty much on every bond in the market. And therefore, when a new issue comes, we know what we can expect from specific types of projects, things like that. Importantly for us, we only invest in securities where there's a process around managing the projects and the proceeds, as well as an external third party auditor. And finally, the issuer has to commit to producing an impact report that basically provides the actual impact of the bond proceeds. Example would be renewable energy generated, these types of things. So with that sort of third party auditing process, it does give us confidence in in the fact that the information that we're giving from the issuer uh, is actually accurate. And I guess from your comments there, it sounds to me that it would be very difficult to run a passive green bond strategy then, given the analysis of the actual project that the money is going into, the yearly impact report, et cetera there. Would, do you think that would be a fair comment? I think we're really focused on ensuring that what we invest in is true to label and we have a very high threshold as to what makes that a green bond or a social bond worth worthwhile because ultimately our investors want to know what we invest in and we want to eliminate any concept of greenwashing in in our process so a passive and there are uh, funds like that in australia where they basically invest in all green bonds for us it is way more important for us to ensure that the securities that we're investing in are high quality impact securities as opposed to something that looks a little bit like business as usual and has basically named green bond when realistically we would, wouldn't view it as a green bond. We just view it as business as usual. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world of investment choice that goes beyond borders. Open up a world of investment opportunity with NetWealth where you can access local and international securities, as well as bonds and foreign currency options for wholesale clients. With managed accounts, managed funds, and access to non-custodial assets. A world of investment awaits you. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. You've touched on ring fencing, the use of the capital. So what evidence is there that all capital raised from these investments goes into ESG? projects and are they actually doing any good? Absolutely. This sort of touches a little bit on what I was just chatting about just a minute ago. It's around this concept of this third party auditing that occurs because we're not going into the 80 different securities, going into the company books and checking that the money's there. We're relying on third party auditors to give the sign of approval and a tick to say absolutely the money only went to X, Y and Z and it basically gives us a level of confidence that the securities that we invest in are actually doing exactly what they said they would. 
So realistically, this concept of the third party auditor plus the impact reporting, which is ultimately a report that comes out that actually talks about the positive impact that you're having with the actual data that gives us sort of the confidence around that these projects are doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, it's interesting, the impact report you've mentioned a couple of times there. So I guess at the end of the day, that shows you definitively if it's actually doing any good, the investment and what sort of, I guess, progress the companies are making at building out a a solar farm or wind farm or something of that nature. Yeah, absolutely. We've touched on greenwashing and and that's prevalent Um, and we hear a lot about it at the moment in the media and the regulator and I think ASIC's been quite strong in this area. So have you got any other more broad comments about how you manage this risk? You've, You've spoken about the yearly impact report, the way you try and look at and understand the project, that it's genuinely green, but any other comments you would make in this area? So greenwashing is basically a practice of overstating or misleading investors in relation to either the environmental credentials of the company or the green bond. The way we manage this initially is analysing the issuer first, the ESG credentials of the issuer, the climate vision that they have, and then we go to the underlying projects and have a look at those projects and do the deep dive there. And a part of what we do before we invest in any of these securities is a huge amount of ESG uh, engagement in relation that we're very comfortable with this concept of alignment of the projects and the issuer's climate vision. Because ultimately, we know what to expect. We don't invest in any labelled green bond just because it's a labelled green bond. We're very discerning in what we invest in. So from our perspective, when we're looking at a project, we want to make sure that it's actually doing something beyond business as usual. Because if it's a business as usual practice, that to us is a vanilla bond. That's not a green bond. From our perspective, it's very much, are they actually contributing or supporting climate stability uh, via renewable energies or reducing emissions for a couple of examples there? Can green bonds be a core defensive allocation in a portfolio? And do they generate the same yields as like as similar bonds in the border universe? Or do investors actually give up some return? And I guess because of the social outcome or the social return that these investments are generating. Yeah, absolutely. Green bonds can be a core allocation in your portfolio. The returns of green bonds primarily follow the returns of the vanilla bonds from the same issuer. So if you've got company X issuing a green bond and also issuing a generic bond, the return profile, very high level, will be reasonably similar. However, there's this concept of a greenium attached to green bonds. When I say greenium, either the price is slightly higher when you're buying it, so a little bit more expensive, or the yield is slightly lower. It is marginal. It's not significant. It's just slightly. However, where you benefit as a green bond holder, because you could say, well, I'm paying a bit more for it, is what happens in the secondary market. The demand for these securities is far stronger than the supply. So if we think about new deals coming to the market, they're anywhere between two times oversubscribed up to eight times oversubscribed how much they're issuing. You can imagine in that scenario how they perform in the secondary market. So even though there's a slight greenium attached to these, the secondary market performance absolutely compensates you for that. So effectively, uh, my take from that is that you can actually sell the bonds in the secondary market for a capital gain. Correct. I guess the other positive uh, point you've made there is that if uh, you're a corporate or an entity wanting to partake in the whole green area, solar panelling or what have you, there's no shortage of capital that you can raise if the project actually stacks up, obviously. Exactly. And there's this, this halo effect for issuers who issue a green bond. So if you've got a listed ASX company issuing a green or a social bond, what tends to happen is that company then promotes to the world that they're issuing these securities. And what happens is the equity investors give that issuer a tick of approval from an ESG perspective, which ultimately can support their equity price in a weird way. So there's actually this halo effect for issuers issuing green bonds. So that's why I, or social bonds or sustainability bonds, that's why I envisage that issuance across many issuers will happen down the track. 
to me, it makes sense that the the equity piece could also get a, a benefit out of it, given that uh, I guess it's giving an indication to the market about the longer term focus and direction of the corporate and that it'll be a sustainable entity and it won't be <laughs> stuck in an old energy business or what have you there. So, no, very interesting, George. Equity ESG portfolios underperform, for example, when oil prices rally, given that these funds will screen out fossil fuels. Do fixed interest ESG portfolios also underperform when oil or perhaps any other old energy commodity rallies? So ESG fixed income portfolios also screen out fossil fuel companies. However, the important point for Australian bond market is oil-related or fossil fuel company-related entities are a very, very small exposure or percent of the bond index in Australia. Now, that's different in the US where there's actually quite a decent size exposure of fossil fuel companies in the US bond market, but in Australia, it's actually very small. So if you're thinking about what a return of a vanilla bond fund will look like versus an ESG bond fund in Australia, and if you specifically focus on the fossil fuel screens, it should be marginal, if anything, because ultimately it doesn't have a big impact on on the market in Australia. Where the ESG funds tend to do well versus a vanilla fund is the fact that they don't invest in companies that have e- significant ESG risks that the market's not really pricing in. So that's why ESG funds tend to do well relative to vanilla funds via this concept of a, of a focus on ESG uh, above and beyond what a vanilla fund would. So, can you explain to listeners how this market's developed and what's been the biggest improvement you've seen over the years? And uh, it's probably fair to say, George, you'd be one of the most experienced people in uh, ESG fixed interest management. In Australia, yeah, that's a fair fair comment. That's probably the case. There's two main developments that we've seen. One is, as we spoke about a bit earlier, is a diversification across sectors and issuers that are in our market now relative to prior years. So that's been a fantastic development. The second development is this concept of a sustainably linked bond. I think they've been around now for a year or two in Australia. Now, the difference between a sustainably linked bond and a green bond is the green bond, as we've discussed, the money's ring-fenced, only used for predetermined projects. It does not go to general corporate activity. The sustainably linked bonds, though, are different in that the money does go to general corporate activity. However, the company or the issuer commits to predetermined targets. So, for instance, they may commit to reducing their emission footprint significantly within a short period of time. So, that's the difference. The money, it's not being ring-fenced for specific projects. The money is going to general corporate activity, but they have this commitment to reduce, for argument's sake, uh, emissions stretch target and above and beyond business as usual. Now, the important point here is these targets are important because firstly, they have to be stretched because they can't be business as usual, otherwise they're just a vanilla bond. And secondly, if the company or entity misses its target, they are penalised by paying a greater interest bill on their bonds. So it's very important for the issuer twofold to hit those targets. Firstly, they don't want to pay additional interest coupon. And secondly, they don't want their name effectively trashed in the ESG world by them basically overcommitting but under-delivering from their uh, their commitments. So the important point about the sustainably linked bonds is, well, there's twofold. It's very important that the targets are stretched. We don't want them to look just like a vanilla bond. And secondly, every entity in the globe effectively can raise money via sustainably linked bonds via commitments to whether it's climate solutions or, or social uh, support, if it's socially supporting the underprivileged, whereas not every entity on the planet can issue a green bond because they don't necessarily have the specific underlying projects. So this concept of sustainably linked bond actually opens the gamut of issuers to issuing ESG bonds globally. You mentioned social bonds. Can social bonds also generate a financial return that's commensurate with the broader universe? There's two types of social bonds. One is a bond where the return profile of the security is linked to the social outcomes. And if the social outcomes miss, the return profile of the bond falls. Now, we don't invest in those specific securities. We wouldn't really call them bond securities. We would call them alternative assets. 
the securities that we invest in where the return profile is basically fixed, as in you know what the return profile is going to be, it's either a coupon or a floating rate bond, and the credit quality is linked to the issuer. So from a social bond perspective, it's no different to a green bond in that you receive your coupons from the issuer, the credit risk is to the issuer, but ultimately the underlying projects are to support the underprivileged in society. So we basically view them the same as a green bond and a social bond, obviously targeting different types of support, whether it's climate stability or, or the underprivileged in society. Maybe just to finish with, George, what do you think will be the biggest issues going forward with ESG or green bonds? The biggest issue right now, and it's become very prominent over the last six months to 12 months, is regulation. So as you mentioned at the start, greenwashing is absolutely a focus from the regulators, and it's basically to ensure that products are true to label. In Europe, they've got this concept of Article 8 and Article 9 funds. Article 8 is where a portfolio is specifically an ESG portfolio, and ESG integration is a standard in what it does. And then Article 9 are those funds that specifically have sustainable goals as one of their objectives. So it has to be a part of their objective. Now, I could see this happening here at some point in the future. I guess what that does is it makes it harder for uh, bonds or fund managers to fudge the impact they're having. We actually welcome all of this uh, given how discerning we are about what we invest in. More regulation, more reporting can only be a benefit and it actually safeguards the industry. And it's actually one of our goals with our engagement efforts is to minimise greenwashing and ensure the industry stays, stays true to label. So so we're, we actually um, are looking forward to greater regulation in, in, in this space. Yes, George. Well, thank you very much for joining us this morning on the Net Wealth Portfolio Construction Podcast. It's been fascinating and very educative to hear about, I guess, the whole growth of the Green Bond Universe, the investment opportunity set uh, for investors, and certainly positive to hear your comments about the way corporates are actually ensuring that the money's ring-fenced and genuinely going into projects that are considered green. And I've always been of the view that the longevity of a company is directly linked to, I guess, the way it adheres to society's standards. And I find that the whole growth of ESG really puts a a strong focus and spotlight on the corporate and ensuring that it's a, a good corporate citizen ultimately there. And we're actually generating an improved standard of living, which is what I think stock markets exist for and capital markets more broadly there. So thanking you for your comments there. And also also very positive to hear that it does certainly sound like that green bonds can be a core part of a strategic asset allocation in a portfolio. They're a long-term investment and they're not, um, I guess, a, um, a shorter-term tactical play that we see a lot of those types of strategies in the market. So again, thank you, George, and I've been very appreciative of the time and your comments this morning. Thank you for having me. Well, one one point I might just leave you with that I've noticed over the last probably three years is the fact that people are using my dedicated ESG strategies now as a core fixed income hold, whereas previously, call it five odd years ago, the ESG funds specifically sat in their ESG sleeve of their balance fund. Now they're actually using my portfolios as their core fixed as income an alpha hold, kicker. So. Um, uh, give it, uh, yeah, give uh, you uh, comments uh, about the secondary market's <laughs> right. pricing. Yeah, performance has been, fortunately, has been quite good. But ultimately, that, that's the most interesting thing that I've seen over the years is that people are loving these specific bonds and the fact that we're reporting them a certain way and they know the impact they're having, as well as the fact that our performance has been pretty good. So, you know, this concept of using it as a core fixed income hold has been absolutely prevalent over the last couple of years. And it certainly makes sense also, given your comments about the credit risk, that at the end of the day, it's simply the credit risk of the issuer. It's not the underlying project there, which yes. may and or it, may not the be issuers. riskier than a, a broader Correct. Uh, capital. And it's the issuers we're investing in anyway. Yeah, so. yeah. 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 No, so uh, thank you very much again, George, for, uh, for joining Great. us today. And certainly to the listeners, I hope you, uh, you've you enjoyed this morning's discussion with George Bichet from Pendle Group on the ESG or the whole development of the Green Bond universe. And I hope you have a great day and I look forward to you joining us on the next instalment of the Net Wealth Portfolio Construction Podcast Series. Great. Thanks, Paul. And, and looking forward to it myself. Thank you. 
Thanks for listening to NetWealth's Portfolio Construction Podcast. Follow the show for future episodes. Leaving a review helps others find the podcast. And for more information and show transcripts, visit netwealth.com.au.